about two-thirds water, right? So you're mostly water. If we look at the water that's in our body, we can divide it up into different compartments. Okay? So we can subdivide it into different compartments, and that's pretty easy to do. We can say of the water that we have in our body, about two-thirds of that water is intracellular. Okay? So it's about 67% is inside cells, which means about one-third of the water is outside of cells. And if we look at the extracellular water, it can be divided into plasma, the fluid of blood, interstitial fluid, the fluid that's found between the cells. So if you look at muscle tissue, it's moist, right? So there's water in the cells, but there's also water outside the cells. So that's the interstitial fluid. And then a compartment that you wouldn't necessarily maybe think of, the lymph fluid. And okay, so we have lymph. So those are the three extracellular compartments. Physiologists like to measure everything that we can possibly measure. And so once they said, wait, this is how the fluid's divided, they said, well, how much fluid is in each of those extracellular compartments? Right? How, how can we figure that out? I, in theory, I guess you could try to right, drain the blood out, drain lymph out. It's still pretty difficult to do that. Instead, rather than having to actually kill the organism, we can figure out the different compartments by using a process that we call the dye-dilution method. The dye-dilution method. Dye being like dye for clothing or something. Right? So we call this the, the dye-dilution method. Here's the, the problem, folks. We have right, a living body. The compartments are in there, but how they're arranged, we don't know. And it's kind of like thinking that uh, maybe I have a giant aluminum can that's been partially crushed, and it's filled full of fluid, and I say, gosh, tell me how much fluid is in that crushed aluminum can. But you don't get to empty it out. Well, it's going to be pretty difficult to figure it out because it's partially crushed, right? If you go back to the days of geometry, if, if it was nice cylinder, we'd say, oh, pi r squared h, that takes care of that, right? We're done. But geometry, what is that? Man. So it's a problem, right? We have this partially crushed can. We can use the dye dilution method to figure out how much fluid is in the can, how much fluid is in different compartments. And the idea is that if we take a known amount of dye, so many milligrams, we put it into the can and shake it up. If it's evenly distributed now in that can, we can sample the solution, look at the concentration, and we can figure out the volume. And so it really is a pretty straightforward equation here. If we know how many milligrams we put into the can, then we mix it, and we sample it, and we find out how many milligrams per liter we have. Well, the milligrams are going to cancel, liters will come to the top, and we'll know the volume. Okay? So it really is a pretty straightforward equation. So the key, then, is to find substances that will go into different compartments in the body, and only into those compartments, allow them to mix, and then sample and then you'll know how much of the fluid is in that particular compartment. Well, we call this the dilution method. So let's look at these compartments. Really what we want to look at here are the intracellular and extracellular compartments. Okay? Intracellular and extracellular compartments. If we look at these, the intracellular and extracellular compartments, we find that they really don't differ much in terms of nutrients and waste. And so you check oxygen, carbon dioxide, urea, different things. They really don't differ much in terms of the nutrients and waste, uh, inside, outside the compartments. <coughs> Excuse me. Pretty similar. What we do find is there are significant differences in the electrolytes between the intracellular compartments and the extracellular compartments. And particularly, we find a major difference in the cations. And so, those of you who have a lab know this already, but a, something like calcium, 
has a positive charge, and so we're going to call that a cation. So those are cations, so we'll say a cation. And what do we call negatively charged things like chloride ion, anions, right? So those are the anions have the negative charge. And, and I always remember positive charge molecules because they have the cation has that plus in the middle, right? So I told me it was a cation. So if we look at the cations inside the cell, so intracellular versus extracellular, we find that there's a significant difference. Inside cells, we find lots of magnesium ion and lots of potassium ion in the intracellular compartment. In the extracellular compartment, we find lots of sodium ion and lots of calcium ion. And this really has to do with the selective permeability of the membrane. And this is going to become more important to us uh, next week when we start talking about nerve and membrane potentials. We'll talk more uh, about this. But, so these are significantly uh, higher inside the cell, magnesium and potassium ion, and outside the cell significantly higher are sodium and calcium. The uh, compartments, the other compartments, are in terms of, of all the other molecules, are constantly mixing. So they're, they're mixing all the time, and our blood allows us to do that with the cardiovascular system. Uh, we estimate that on average, all of the fluids in the body mix with all the other fluids of the body somewhere between 10 to 30 minutes, uh, which is, to me, seems amazing. So as if we injected a drug into your big toe, uh, as long as it wasn't something that was going to be like oil-based or something that's going to be held there, if we come back and check somewhere between 10 to 30 minutes, it will mix with the fluid that's in your brain in 10 to 30 minutes. I think that's amazing, right? That's an amazing turnover. In a sense, we're kind of giant washing machines, right? Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. It's all being mixed constantly uh, with differences because of these electrolytes in the membrane. But the overall compartment is huge amounts of, of mixing that, that's occurring. All right, so let's look at how molecules are moving in the body and across cells. Um, the very first way that I have up here that molecules move is by a process called bulk flow. Okay? Bulk flow. Molecules moving as a unit due to a difference in pressure. So molecules are moving as a unit due to a difference in pressure, uh, and these two young kids are enjoying bulk flow of water coming out of a hose. All right, so why does the water come out of the hose? There's more pressure in the hose, right, really at the faucet, than there is at the end. Right? And so in bulk flow, the flow occurs because there's a difference in pressure, and then it turns out that the resistance has a factor, so we study that the flow is equal to the difference in pressure over resistance. Difference in pressure over resistance. It's got to be a difference in pressure. If you put a cap on the end of that hose, there could still be pressure in the hose, but water wouldn't be flowing anymore, right? Because there's no longer a difference in pressure. Related to bulk flow is something called filtration. You learned about this in, in chemistry. A uh, pretty straightforward idea. We can do bulk flow, but put a filter in the way of the movement of the molecules so that big molecules are separated from smaller molecules, right? So we still have the difference in pressure, but we're going to put a filter in the system. We call this then filtration. It's modified bulk flow. We just simply put a filter in the system. Another way that molecules move in the body is by a process called diffusion. Diffusion is the movement of molecules from a greater concentration to a lesser concentration. And it's due just simply to the random movement of molecules. So if we turned off all the ventilation in this room, and I put a little bit of aftershave in the corner, eventually the molecules would bang into each other enough that they would spread out and you would smell the, the aftershave. Here's an experiment you can do on your own at home, right? So you just say, kids, don't do this on your own at home. This one you can do on your own at home. Take a glass of water, take some food coloring, a little drop of blue or red food coloring, drop it into the glass, 
and let it sit. And gradually, the molecules of food coloring will bang into each other and spread throughout the water. You don't have to stir it. It will spread by diffusion. Again, it's due to the random movement of molecules. All the molecules around us are moving. And certainly, in the air, that's easy to think about. And maybe in water. But even the molecules in the desk and the chair are moving. Which that's not so easy to think about. But all molecules are in motion. I remember reading a study, this was years ago, but they, they took a piece of gold and they sat it on a piece of lead. And they left it for like 30 years. And then they checked and they found that some of the gold molecules had diffused into some of the lead. And some of the lead had diffused into some of the gold. So even in solids, the molecules are moving. The exception to that, right, you learn in chemistry, is if we get to absolute zero, where all molecular motion ceases. But otherwise, the molecules are in constant motion. They bang into each other, and as they bang into each other, they spread out. You let me use another example here. If I took a cardboard box and dumped some marbles in there, and I put all the marbles maybe in the corner, and I keep the box level, and now I shake the box really hard, keeping it level. When we look in again, what do we expect to see with the marbles? They're all spread out. How come? Because they bang into each other, and as they bang into each other, they tend to spread out. Okay, so molecules are in constant motion, and the molecules are going to end up then moving from a greater concentration to a lesser concentration, right? From a greater concentration to a lesser concentration, just like my marbles in the corner of the box. When we talk about the molecules moving, we can use the term flux. Right? We can use the term flux to mean the movement of molecules across some particular space or, or area per unit time, right? And so if, if we took some molecules and we put them all on one side here of a line, arbitrary line, and they would bang into each other. If they could cross that line, eventually some of the molecules would go across, and if three moved across, we'd say, oh, the flux was three molecules per second or something. In diffusion, we're really interested in the net flux. And so we would have to take into account that as these molecules moved, in this case from left to right, as molecules started to accumulate on the other side, some banging around would go over here, and some of the molecules would move back. And so if three molecules moved to the right and one moved to the left, we would say the net flux was two to the right. Yes, it's considered the, the net flux. Well, in diffusion, as those molecules are moving from a greater concentration to a lesser concentration, eventually the molecules will be evenly distributed, and for every molecule that moves to the right, one will move to the left, and we'll say that the net flux is equal to zero, and at that point we say we have diffusion equilibrium. Right, so the molecules will spread out enough that eventually, for every one that moves one direction, one will move back, the net flux is zero, and we now have diffusion equilibrium. All right, so let's look at, at some of the factors that influence, some factors that, that influence the rate of diffusion. So what, what I have here uh, is a relationship that says the diffusion rate is proportional to the difference in concentration times the temperature times the cross-sectional area. And PowerPoint didn't like my line, so I made this big line in there. All right? So those are in the, the numerator. Down here in the denominator, I have over the square root of molecular weight times the distance. So let's look at our first one here. Difference in concentration. Does it make sense that the greater the, the difference in concentration, the greater the rate of diffusion? Right? So if I had 20 molecules on one side and zero on the left, there would be some rate of diffusion. But if I had 20 on the right and 18 on the left, there would be a slower rate of diffusion. Right? Because they'd be banging into each other and coming back. So 
the greater the difference in concentration, the greater the rate of diffusion. Temperature has an, an effect. The greater the temperature, the greater the rate of diffusion. How can we explain that? Molecules move faster. Kinetic theory, right? As the temperature goes up, the molecules are banging around more often. They're going to tend to move faster. And the cross-sectional area, the greater the cross-sectional area, the greater the rate of diffusion. This one's not so easy. It's a little harder to kind of try to picture the cross-sectional area effect. Uh, and the example that I use here, folks, is what if there was smoke on the other side of those two doors? So we know molecules are going to diffuse, going from a greater concentration to a lesser. So right now, the only way the smoke could get in here is around the cracks, right? Down at the bottom and between the doors. It would be a pretty slow rate of diffusion because the cross-sectional area is very small. But if I walked over and I opened the doors, the rate of diffusion would go up because the cross-sectional area has increased. Right? So the greater the cross-sectional area, the greater the rate of diffusion. So all three of those variables are in our numerator, and so they are directly proportional to the rate of diffusion. As they go up, rate of diffusion goes up. As they go down, rate of diffusion goes down. Now let's look at the denominator. One of the factors here is the square root of the molecular weight. The greater the molecular weight of the molecule, the slower the rate of diffusion. The greater the molecular weight, the slower the rate of diffusion. This really has to do with something that, that in physics we learn is, has to do with conservation of momentum, more than what we need to get into in this class. But bigger molecules tend not to move as quickly as the smaller molecules. And then finally, down here in the denominator, we have the effect of distance. The greater the distance, the slower the rate of diffusion, right? Because it's in the denominator. The greater the distance, the slower the rate of diffusion. So as the molecules start to spread out further and further and further, does it make sense? It's harder and harder for them to go back and bang into each other. Right? So the greater the distance that you have to cover, the slower the rate of diffusion. And this is not something that we put numbers in to calculate this, folks. It's a relationship. So we're trying to show a proportion, right? The diffusion rate is proportional to directly those things in the numerator, and inversely, those things in the denominator. And let's not forget that when we looked at the cell membrane, that polarity can affect the movement of molecules across the cell membrane. So those are all factors that affect the movement of molecules just in general. But when we looked at the cell membrane, we learned that there was a phospholipid bilayer, right? The phospholipids are lipids. And so molecules that are nonpolar or less polar can actually go through that phospholipid bilayer pretty easily. And so we call those molecules hydrophobic molecules. Phobic means fear, right? So those are the hydrophobic molecules. They are water-fearing, nonpolar fat substances go readily through the cell membrane because the cell membrane is mostly phospholipid. On the other hand, hydrophilic molecules, water-loving molecules, have a hard time going through the cell membrane because most of the cell membrane is lipids. Right? Because phospholipids, hydrophilic substances are going to actually have to go along pores next to proteins, little tiny pores that are next to the proteins. Proteins are charged molecules, right? And so the hydrophilic things have to go next to the proteins. <coughs> that can go well through the hydrophobic bile uh, of the phospholipids. All right. Dialysis. Dialysis is the movement of molecules from a greater concentration to, to a lesser concentration through a selectively permeable membrane. Greater concentration to a lesser concentration, but through a selectively permeable membrane. So here my diagram is trying to show this is a selectively permeable membrane. The small molecules, the blue in this case, are banging into each other, and they can pass to the other side by diffusion 
but these big red molecules can't because they can't fit through. Okay? And of course, you've all heard of dialysis because you've heard of, of kidney dialysis, right? Renal dialysis. We'll talk about renal dialysis when we get to the urinary system. But for now, it's enough for us to know that dialysis is the separation of molecules by using a selectively permeable membrane so that molecules that are small can diffuse through, big molecules can't. Looks an awful lot like uh, filtration, doesn't it? What's the difference between filtration and dialysis? Then? Is that both of them? It's kind of a filter here. How about there's no pressure, right? In dialysis, we don't have to have pressure. It's just diffusion, but filtration required a difference in pressure because it was cold flow. Osmosis, the movement of water from a greater concentration to a lesser concentration across a selectively <laughs> permeable membrane. Right? Movement of water from a greater concentration to a lesser concentration across a selectively permeable membrane. Um, and so this diagram is trying to show this idea that if you have more solute on one side, which means less water, and the other side less solute but more water, water will go from more water to less water. Those of you who have labs today, we're doing a very simple experiment, but it shows the process of osmosis. And so in lab today, we're taking a thistle tube. Inside the thistle tube, we're going to put 60% sucrose. If it's 60% sucrose, what percent water is it? 40% water. Right? We're going to put a selectively permeable membrane here, and then we're going to drop that into a beaker of pure water, 100% water. And so let's go back to our definition. We said, in osmosis, water moves from a greater concentration of water to a lesser concentration of water across a selectively permeable membrane. And so what's going to happen here in my diagram, water will move from more water, 100%, to the 40%, and we're going to drive the height of that column up. As water moves in, it will be diluting that other side, right? We're going from more water to, to less water. Before I got married, I used to be able to say that, that you would go and check my refrigerator and you would find some wilted celery uh, in my, my refrigerator. My wife makes sure that doesn't happen anymore, right? But uh, maybe you have some wilted celery at home uh, in your refrigerator. So one of the things, maybe a trick that you maybe learned, is that if it's not too badly wilted, you can cut the bottom off of the celery and you can stick that into fresh water and the celery will perk up. Right? Well, why is it perking up if you why is it being fresh? Osmosis. Osmosis. Water's going from more water outside the cells to inside the cells of the plant. Right? So you can do that experiment on your own at home. Right? More water to less water. So another common thing, right? With if you have lettuce before you you serve it, maybe, hopefully, you wash it. That's good. It takes off if there's any pesticides, but it does something else. The water goes into the lettuce and causes that lettuce to take up water, which makes it, right, nice and crisp. More water to less water. When my son Nathan was little, uh, he used to take really long baths, right? He'd like to get in there and play with his rubber duckies and his army men and all kinds of things. And of course, when they're little, you can't leave them sitting in the bath. You gotta watch them because you don't want them to drown. Right? So I just take a book and go in there and sit and Nathan would play for an hour in the bathtub, right? Uh, and then finally he'd get out and he'd say, Daddy, look, my fingers have all turned to raisins. And his fingers would all be wrinkled. What was going on there? Must be some thought osmosis again, right? Um, most water was gonna be outside, right? The pure water and less water in his cells. So water was going from more water to less water in his cells, and his cells were expanding, and as they expanded, it caused the wrinkling that you see, right? As water went into those, those skin cells. Our skin's pretty good at being, trying not to let water in, but if you soak it, soak it, soak it, water will gradually get in. Water goes from more water to less water. It turns out that 
we can look at this movement of water by doing a, another simple experiment. You could take and put a selectively permeable membrane on, on one side of something that had pure water on this side. This side we have a glucose solution, right? So solute and water, but of course this has less water. If this membrane was able to move, and this was some kind of a piston, as water moved across that selectively permeable membrane, it would accumulate over here, and what would happen to this membrane then? It would move to the left. So you could actually do work with this. Right? Water moving from more water to less water. If we look at our cellular level, it turns out that in our cells, there are little tiny pores that allow the water to move. Those little tiny pores we call aquaporins. There are aquaporins, and the, not that we need to know this, but the 2002 Nobel Prize went for the discovery of these little pores, these aquaporins. So, osmosis of the movement of molecules from more water, or movement of water from more water to less water across the selectively permeable membrane. When we're trying to think of whether or not the water will move, we need to be able to think about the concentration of the solute. And so in chemistry, you learn the term molarity. Right? You learn the term molarity. So I'm going to hurt your brains here. Right? You learn that if you take a mole of some molecule and you put it into a beaker and you fill that up to the liter mark, right? They're trying to show you this, right? So in this case, a mole of glucose, you put it in the beaker, you fill that up to the liter mark, you would have a one molar solution of glucose, right? It's a measurement of concentration. If I put two moles of glucose into there and I fill it to the liter mark, what would I have? A two molar concentration, right? Well, in physiology, we're concerned with really how much water is there if we want to consider osmosis. So we are going to use a little different term that we need, and it's the term molality. Okay? Molality. A little subtle difference here. In molality, we're going to take a liter of water and we're going to add a mole of glucose. You see the difference? Over here, we added the glucose, filled it to a liter. And if you think about that for a minute, you have less than a liter of water in there because the glucose took up some space. But in this case, molality, we're going to have a liter of water, then we're going to add our mole of glucose, and so we know we have a liter of water. We haven't displaced any with the glucose. Let's stop there. Quiz on Monday, folks. Uh, start thinking about the test of the movement of water from more water to less water across a selectively permeable membrane. Uh, and we can talk just a little bit about these two different terms, molarity and molality. So you know that in order to make a one molar solution, you learned this in chemistry, you're going to put a mole of some solute into a flask, you fill it up to the one liter mark, and you'll have a one molar solution. But I told you there's another term that's important for us in here, molality, where we want to know the concentration of water. And so in molality, we're going to fill it to one liter, and then we're going to add the mole. Just as a for instance, if we look at something like this, in order to make a, a one molar glucose, you're going to put in 180 grams of glucose. If you wanted to make a one molar solution of sodium chloride, you'd only put in 58 grams. So clearly there would be a difference if we're doing molarity, there would be a difference in the amount of water required to get to the one liter mark. But if we make a molal solution, you have a liter of water, you're going to add a mole of glucose or you're going to add a mole of sodium chloride. Right? So we always know the amount of, of uh, solvent that's in there, the amount of, of water. <clears throat> There's another term that becomes important to us in here because of osmosis, and that's the term osmolality. Osmolality. <clears throat> if we put a mole of glucose into a liter of water, we have a one 
molal solution of glucose, we also have a one osmolal solution of glucose. But if I put a mole of sodium chloride into a liter of water, I'll have a one molal NaCl solution, but I'll have a two osmolal solution. Because you know that sodium and chloride break apart. And we now have twice the number of particles in there that we had, uh, well, for instance, with glucose. So if we wanted to define just a one osmolal solution, we would say a one os osmolal solution is one mole of a non-ionizing solute placed in one liter of water. But we could still make a one osmolal solution using sodium chloride. If I wanted to make a one osmolal solution of sodium chloride and I had one liter water, how many moles of sodium chloride should I put in there? Half. Half, right? Because as soon as I put it in, it splits into two. You know, when I first learned this, I had the darndest time trying to figure out what the heck was going on. I couldn't get it. Uh, it was, I was in, in high school, had a really good chemistry teacher, and I kept scratching my head, and he said, okay, Gary, if I bring five bicycles into the room, how many bicycles have I brought in the room? I said, well, five. And then he said, well, how many bicycle tires are now in the room? I said, well, there's ten. Said, there you go. <laughs> right? So if we have something that can split apart, it doubles the osmolality. Because in osmosis, it doesn't matter what the size of the particles is, it simply matters the number of particles. And if you have twice as many particles, you create twice the osmotic pressure. And so this diagram is trying to show this concept. That if I started with one mole of glucose, or one mole of glucose on this side, and one mole of NaCl on this side, the NaCl splits into twice as many particles, and so because I have twice as many particles, water's gonna start to move from the glucose side to the sodium chloride side, right? Trying to, to even this out so that eventually we'll have one and a half osmolal on, on each side. Okay. We have some terms that we use for osmotic solutions. And there's, there's really two sets of terms here that are very similar. We have to be a little bit careful. But the first term I have here is ice osmotic. We can use that term if two solutions have the same osmotic concentration. So I can, can make a solution, uh, a one molal solution of glucose and a one molal solution of glucose. They're both one osmolal glucose. And I would say they are ice osmotic. Right? They have an equal osmotic concentration to each other. Hyperosmotic, a solution that has a greater osmotic concentration than some reference solution. Right? So that if I put a mole of glucose in one solution, a mole of sodium chloride in the other one liter, the, the sodium chloride is going to become a two osmolal solution, and I can say it is hyperosmotic to the one osmolal solution of glucose. And then, of course, the opposite of that would be hypoosmotic, a solution that has less of an osmotic concentration. You won't see these terms used really outside physiology, folks. Uh, in the real world, you're going to see tonicity terms, which we're going to look at in a minute. But I would like you to know these. In, in physiology, we use them. Uh, these are comparison terms that have to be compared to some other solution. So you have to say, this solution is hyperosmotic to that solution. It's like me walking into the room and saying, I'm taller. Come on. Taller than what? Or whom? Right? It doesn't make any sense. Taller? Taller than what? Right? So if I said, I have a hyperosmotic solution, you've got to say, what's it hyperosmotic to? Okay. These are the terms that you're going to run into much more commonly <coughs> outside of physiology. <laughs> tonic terms or tonicity terms. Iso means equal. So if something is isotonic, it's a solution that has the same osmotic concentration as a cell. Okay? It has the same osmotic solution as a cell. 
it won't cause the cell to shrink nor to swell. Okay? So we say isotonic. Tonic means pressure. Iso means equal, so equal pressure, an isotonic solution. Hypertonic, it has a greater solute concentration than a cell. And so a hypertonic solution will cause the cell to shrink. We say that the, the cell crenates. Okay? So hard to see there. If you look closely on your handout, it says crenation down here. I think I'd write that one for you. Right? So a hypertonic solution causes a cell to shrink or to crenate. Hypotonic, hypo means less, so a hypotonic solution is going to cause a cell to swell. Okay? It has less solute than the cell, and so the cell will swell. In this case, they're trying to show that if they put it in red blood cells in there, the cell might swell so much it might lice when, it, when this occurs. And we're going to do an experiment uh, like this, uh, well, those of you who have lab, on Wednesday and then actually next Monday. It turns out that an isotonic saline solution for most cells in our body is a 0.9%. NaCl solution. Sometimes people will call this solution normal saline. So those of you that wear contacts, oftentimes you'll have a solution that will say on that normal saline. And so when you put your contacts in there, uh, it's a normal salt solution that when placed in the eye won't cause the cells to shrink or swell. It won't hurt your eyes. It turns out that a 0.9% NaCl solution is also a 300 milliosmolal solution. So a 0.9% NaCl solution is also a 300 milliosmolal solution. 300 milliosmolal is an isotonic solution. So if I made a 300 milliosmolal glucose solution, it would be isotonic. Make sense? Turns out it's a 5% <coughs> glucose solution because when you're doing percents, you actually have to take into account the weight of the molecules. Right? Yes? Um, I don't understand what a milli is. <coughs> a milli means a thousandth. A milli means a thousandth. So a milli osmolal would be a thousandth um, of an osmolal. That makes sense. Uh, you could also write it, if you didn't like milli osmolal, right? You could write it as a 0.3. Osmolal. Be the same thing. Um, so, these are the common terms that you're going to run into. Tonicity terms. Okay? Tonicity terms. The last thing I have up here, I have trading solutes. And so, there is one more part of this movement of molecules that we have to consider. And that is that sometimes molecules are capable of penetrating membranes, which changes what happens here a bit. So let's say, for our discussion here, that I'm going to set up our little osmosis experiment. Those of you who have lab, which we did in lab, here's our selectively permeable membrane. And I'm going to make a 300 milliosmolal, I can't fit it all in there, uh, solution of urea. Okay. And out here, I'm going to make a 300 milliosmolal solution of NaCl. And I, I have a membrane that won't let those particles move. And of course, we could say that the two solutions are isosmotic to each other. Right? We we'll just use those. And so we would not expect the water to go up or down. Right? Everybody's comfortable with that, hopefully. So we know that if I drop red blood cells into the NaCl solution, what, what's going to happen if I put red blood cells into the NaCl solution? 300 milliosmolal? Nothing. Nothing, right? It is isotonic to the red cells. And so one might think then, if I took and dropped red blood cells into the 300 milliosmolal urea solution, that the cells would neither shrink nor swell either. We would think it would be isotonic, wouldn't you? 
you would think that. Except, it turns out, urea is capable of penetrating through cell membranes. Okay? So it, it can move through cell membranes. And once urea moves through the cell membranes, the water follows and the 300 milliosmolal solution of urea will cause the red cells to lice. So really what's happening, if here's my red blood cell, and let's just for discussion say that there's three particles in there, and I put out here three particles of solution of urea. Right, so this is my urea. These are things that can't get out, proteins. If urea can diffuse down its gradient from a greater urea concentration to a lesser, if just one of those moves inside, where's the most water now? Inside. Outside. Outside. So water will follow, going from more water to less water, the cell will expand and actually explode. In those of you that have lab uh, on Monday, a week from today, you'll get a chance to do this experiment and you'll see that this, this is going to occur. So even though the urea solution was made ice osmotic to an isotonic saline solution, the urea solution was not isotonic because it was capable of penetrating through cell membranes. Those of you that use lotions, when you go home today, take a look at the label on the lotion that you use and see if somewhere lists urea. Sometimes they do. Not that commonly, but sometimes they'll list urea. Why would they want to put urea into a lotion? It would penetrate the cells and water would follow. You see what's going to happen? You put, let's say you have little wrinkles around your eyes. You rub the lotion into that area. The urea is going to penetrate into the cells. What will happen next? Water will follow, cause the cells to swell, and the little wrinkles will go away. Right? When I first read this and saw that urea was in there, it kind of pissed me off. <laughs> urea. <laughs> anyway. uh, all right. So bad. Mediated transport systems. Okay? Mediated transport systems. To mediate means to help. Right? So sometimes, uh, for instance, if a, a union goes on strike, the uh, government will say, well, you need to bring in a mediator to try to mediate the differences between the union and the owner, the employer. Right? So to mediate means to help. So, Mediated transport systems means we're going to have helper molecules, things that will help the movement of the molecules. Okay? Mediated transport systems. When we look at the differences between mediated transport systems and diffusion, there are some really uh, big differences here. Molecules are going to be moved by carriers rather than just move through the membrane. The carriers are going to be highly specific, so they're not going to just carry any old molecule. They're going to be specific, only carrying or helping certain molecules. The carriers can become saturated. Okay, so when we were talking about enzymes, we said enzymes could become saturated. And I think I used the analogy, I'll, not, I'll use it now, uh, right? If, if the fireman was outside and said, let's have a fire drill. Did I use this analogy before? No. Uh, he said, let's have a fire drill. And they said, OK. Gosh, you got about 90 students in this class. Let's cut the number of students in half first. We'll have the fire drill. They have people stationed out there, and they say, let's see how fast they come out the doors. Well, there's four doors to get out, right? And they say, okay, we had 45 students in here, and they came out at uh, four students per second or something. And then said, okay, let's double the number. Let's go to 90 and see if the rate that the students come out doubles. And they, they ring the bell, and they say, gosh, it didn't double. How come it didn't double? The doors became saturated, right? Pretty soon the doors were all elbowing, trying to get our way out. And if you doubled again, the rate's not going to get any higher, right? So that's very different than what we talked about in diffusion, where we said the greater the difference in concentration, the greater the rate of diffusion. In mediated transport systems, because you have a carrier, the carriers can become saturated, and they can't go any faster once they're, they're saturated. Uh, and there can be competition for the carrier. So sometimes similar molecules will compete for the same carrier. <clears throat> the first type of mediated transport that I have up here is something called facilitated diffusion. 
facilitated the fusion. Well, here we go with another word that means to help. To facilitate means to help, right? If you facilitate the, uh, the old lady crossing across the street, you helped her cross the street, right? To facilitate means to help. It is still diffusion. And we know that in diffusion, molecules are going to go from a greater concentration to a lesser concentration. But now, we're going to have carriers, protein carriers that are found in the cell membrane. And so this diagram is trying to show, here's some molecules of glucose. We want to move them to the inside. Glucose is a pretty large molecule, folks, and it's relatively uh, polar. It can't move easily through cell membranes. Okay? It needs to be helped. If we have a special carrier for the glucose, it can help move the glucose. And, and it's trying to show you uh, how this might work. One way to picture this, this, this model, I think it's a pretty good idea of how this might work, is to kind of picture the old-fashioned wooden clothespins. People don't even know what I'm talking about probably anymore. But an old-fashioned wooden clothespin. And so the glucose moves in. Once it attaches, the clothespin, the protein, changes shape and opens on the other side, and the glucose can move to the inside. So it's still diffusion, greater concentration to a lesser concentration, but we have to have a carrier in the membrane to help it. We're going to learn later, when we get to the endocrine system, that glucose moves by facilitated diffusion into cells like our liver cells and our skeletal muscle cells and our adipose cells, and it's stimulated, this facilitated diffusion is stimulated by a hormone that you know already, it's called insulin. It turns out, we'll, we'll go over this later when we get to the endocrine system, that insulin actually causes the carriers to come up to and join with the membrane so that you put more carriers in and you can move more glucose in. It, not that you need to know it here, but it roughly increases movement of glucose into cells by 20 times. Right? So glucose can hardly move into cells without these carriers. Okay? So we call this facilitated diffusion. Yes? So insulin is the carrier. No, insulin's the hormone that stimulates special vesicles inside the cell to move to the membrane and become carriers. Mm -hmm. we'll, when we get to the endocrine system, we'll look at it. Yes? Is this kind of related? It kind of sounds similar to like the coenzymes and cofactors. Yeah, you can kind of think of it that way. That we need a helper. Right? Kind of think of it that way. We need, they need, the certain molecules need to be helped to get into the cell. Right? And we call this facilitated diffusion. Another type of mediated transport is something that we call active transport. And the key word there is active, meaning the cell's going to have to spend energy, ATP, in order for active transport to get through, or to, to move molecules through. Um, it turns out that, that virtually every cell in your body actively transports sodium and potassium. By some estimates, we think that you spend every day somewhere between 10 and 40 percent of your energy, depending on what cells you're looking at, just pumping sodium and potassium, and actively transporting the sodium and potassium. Many other molecules are actively transported in the body, things like iodide and hydrogen ion. You know that there's lots of acid in your stomach, right? Where do you think the acid comes from? It comes from your blood. But how can we get lots of acid into our stomach? We actively transport it into the stomach. Right? So we use this process called active transport. Um, so in active transport, we're going to require ATP. We can get the movement of molecules to go against a concentration gradient. That's very different than diffusion. We can pump the molecules uphill okay, against a concentration gradient. Let's think about that one just for a minute. Uh, maybe before you came to class, you had uh, a candy bar. Okay? You digest that. The glucose ends up being in your intestines. We want the glucose to be absorbed, right? So we want to get it into our bloodstream. If it was moving by diffusion, 
the very best that you could do would be to get to an equal concentration with what's in your blood, right? So if it was facilitated diffusion, the very best would be equal to what's in your blood. But the reality is we're able to pull all of those glucose molecules back. We can pull them all back. So that if we check your feces, there's no glucose in your feces. I've had people tell me before that their feces don't stink, but I've never had somebody tell me their feces were sweet. Okay? Uh, because we can lower the level all the way down to zero. We pull it all back. So there must be some mechanism that allows molecules to move uphill against a concentration gradient. Okay? And we call this active transport. Turns out for glucose, it's going to be something very special. We'll look at that. Uh, but this is trying to show you how this works. So, so here's a, a diagram trying to show the active transport of, of calcium. So similar model to what we did with facilitated diffusion. The molecule that we need to move is going to bind to the carrier. But something special has to happen. The carrier doesn't change shape unless ATP binds. And ATP binds, we spin the high energy bond that's in ATP. That causes the shape change and allows the molecule to go uphill against the concentration gradient. The other day we were talking about the concentrations of sodium and potassium. And we learned that there's much more potassium inside a cell much more sodium outside the cell. Now it turns out, we're going to learn today, later, that that's due to the permeability of the cell to potassium and sodium, but it's also due to the fact that we have an active transport system that actively picks up potassium that's on the outside and pumps it to the inside and actively picks up any sodium that's leaked inside and pumps it to the outside. Uh, in this case, both molecules have to be joined with the carrier, and we need ATP again. Okay. So this is active transport. We actively transport lots of things. Vitamins, amino acids, glucose is going to be a special kind, sodium, potassium, hydrogen ion, calcium. There's lots of different molecules that can go uphill. Right? They're going against the concentration gradient. Is that just a protein then? It's a protein, a carrier protein. And the sodium potassium, not that it matters a whole lot to us right here, but it turns out that when this occurs, actually three sodiums have to bind and two potassiums have to bind, so it's a kind of a three to two ratio. And I don't care that we really know that at this point. Uh, glucose, the movement of glucose in uh, this active transport is actually by a special kind of transport that we call secondary or co-transport. Okay, so we're going to call it secondary transport or co-transport. A little different. So we've got to look at this one here. So first, let's distinguish here. We've already said glucose moves by facilitated diffusion into liver cells, skeletal muscle cells, adipose cells. It's diffusion. Facilitated, but diffusion. But in a couple of spots in the body, in your intestines, and in the nephrons of your kidneys, we've got to move glucose by active transport so that we don't leave glucose behind. We don't want glucose to be lost in your urine. We don't want glucose to be lost in your feces. So we're going to actively transport it uphill against the gradient with a special kind of transport. That's, it's a type of, of active transport, but we call it secondary or co-transport. And this diagram is trying to show why it's a little bit different. So in secondary or co-transport, here's our carrier. Glucose is going to bind with the carrier, but we also have to have sodium combine with the carrier. That causes the, the molecule, the protein carrier, to change shape and allows glucose to go uphill, go against its gradient. It's still really linked to active transport. Why, why I'm talking about it here, because once sodium's inside, what do we know what's going to happen to sodium that's inside the cell? It's going to be actively transported back out. So the only way that glucose can move inside these cells in this co-transport is if sodium's being actively transported. And if we poison the system, that is, if we stop the cell so that it can't make ATP, 
glucose won't move anymore because there won't be sodium to right, allow it to, sodium won't be there to help carry it to the inside of the cell. Right. So we, we call this secondary or co-transport, a modification really of active transport. So active transport occurs everywhere, but secondary transport is only in the nephron and the intestine? Every cell in your body does some active transport. Every cell. And the nephrons do active transport. But for the movement of glucose, it's a special kind of active transport called co-transport or secondary transport. And that's only going to be in your intestines or in the nephron. The next one here, when molecules move across sheets of cells, molecules may diffuse at one side and actually tr be transported at the other. So let's think about glucose again for a minute in the intestines. Um, so it's trying to show, well, actually this is doing the nephron. It's the same idea. It doesn't matter. Okay, so here's the, the inside of the kidney. There's glucose and sodium. We don't want the glucose to be lost in the urine. We want the glucose to get out into the blood, right? We want to pull it back, same as in the intestines. So we're going to co-transport that glucose into that nephron cell or into the intestinal epithelial cell. But that's not really where we want the glucose to be, right? Not just in that cell. We want it to be in the blood. And so when we have to transport molecules, it doesn't matter if here it's glucose, but when we have to transport molecules across a sheet of cells, okay? so a sheet meaning, right, you've got a whole bunch of different cells lined up here, into the intestines, into the nephron, wherever it is, what we commonly find is that one side of the membrane will actively transport the molecule, the other side will let the molecule diffuse. So here, right, we're actively transporting, in a sense, co-transporting glucose into the cell. Once we get it into the cell, it can move out the other side, in this case by facilitated diffusion. Right? Because we're going to concentrate it in here, and then we can allow it to move into the blood because we're concentrating. Right? So when we're moving across a sheet, we'll actively transport on one side, diffuse out the other, or in this case, facilitated diffusion out the other side. And then finally, I say poisons can be used to determine if the transport's active or passive. I kind of mentioned that already, that uh, if we were checking to see how glucose moved in the intestines, if you took intestinal cells and stopped those cells' ability to make ATP, we'd find that glucose would no, no longer move if it was using co-transport or active transport. But if it was by diffusion, the glucose would still move, right? Because if the cells don't have to have energy to do diffusion. Okay, so that was mediated transport. Okay, so that was mediated transport. New item, something called bulk transport. It's not a type of mediated transport. Okay, bulk transport. Sometimes we want to move large molecules across cell membranes in bulk. And we have a way of doing this. You learned about it already when you were taking anatomy. It turns out that we can move molecules in by a process called phagocytosis or by pinocytosis, and that simply has to do with whether they're big or large molecules. So here it's trying to show that these molecules, say proteins, join to the cell membrane, it causes a vesicle to pinch off, and we move it to the inside, phagocytosis. The classic one would be a white blood cell doing phagocytosis on a bacterium, right? So it would surround the bacterium and bring the bacterium in, phagocytosis. Pinocytosis means cell drinking, smaller particles. But both pino and phagocytosis are examples of what we would call endocytosis, okay? Because we're, we're bringing things into the cell. The opposite of endocytosis is exocytosis, and we talked about this already when we were talking about Dr. Golgi's apparatus. Right? We said that the Golgi apparatus packages things up, exports them to the membrane, so the vesicle joins with the membrane, the proteins are released to the outside. 
and we call that exocytosis. All right, so that was the movement of molecules. <laughs>